Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be giving you part two for Fuchsia OS. I know it's been almost, what, 11 months since I did the initial video on Fuchsia? But I felt like uh, there was a couple of things that when I was playing around with the you can build and so forth, the, the environment wasn't ready. I mean, I, there was, I would get it to work one time and then not the next, and then there would be stuff that would work and stuff that wouldn't. It would connect to the server. So, yeah, so I, I just needed time to figure it out, and I just kind of shelved it for a while. But then y'all started asking about, where where is this thing? <laughs> where is part two in December? So I owe you that, and that's what this is all about. Hope you enjoy this. We're going to do uh, we're gonna do an install. We're going to configure Fuchsia. We're going to compile it from source. And then we're going to kick the tires on a few things. I'm not going to go too deep into it because uh, the exploring Fuchsia at this point with the build that you have uh, is mostly meant for developers. So if you want to write code for it, then... Uh, I would suggest go out and, and go through the Explore Fuchsia tutorials on your own. So, all right, let's get started. So what we're going to do at, right now is we're going to go ahead and set up a Fuchsia environment and get it compiled get set because there isn't a there is no iso file that you could just put on a virtual machine or anything like that or to install it even on hardware the only way to right now to get fuchsia is to build it from source so if uh, if you're interested in following on along with these steps you can go to the it's called uh, fuchsia.dev and that is the website where you will find the getting started guide. And that's what I will be using today as the means to get started. So the first thing you will want to do is to make sure that your machine is set up correctly and has been configured in the BIOS and so forth. And also you have KVM in installed and QEMU installed in order to be able to, to bring up an, a uh, viable environment. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to check that. And you do that by executing a, and you'll need curl for this. And it's going to go out to storage Google APIs, Fuchsia, FFX, and then it will do a pre for, a pre uh, a pre flight on the platform. So, okay, so let's take a look and see what we got. So the first thing is we need to build dependencies. We need to have curl get and unzip. That's a check. We've got, it's good. This one said it did not find a tested and supported graphics acceleration card. Now, this machine, as you can see, has an RTX 3070, and that is not supported by Fuchsia. However, that will not start, stop us from doing a command line environment or being able to experiment with it that way. It just prevents, it will prevent Flutter from coming up correctly. So this one down here though, we do have to take care of and you can see that it, it did not find a ToonTap device called QEMU and we can, we can verify that. <laughs> and yeah, I, I do have a number of interfaces on this box. There's a Docker. And then the this particular bridge is for Docker, so that has to, that ties back up to this. So that has nothing to do with the Fuchsia environment. So you'll notice that there was a couple of commands that we could run. So let's go ahead and do that. This is setting up a a a, a tunnel and a tap uh, that allows me to connect with QEMU. So. We'll go ahead and do that. And then the next part is we need to bring the link up. Now it's not actually going to show up until we get it connected. So, but there is my, there is my QEMU and you can see that it is not up. It is up as far as this is concerned, but there's no carrier associated with it. So that's all good. Uh, and so we can go on to the next step. Uh, well, let's rerun the pre-flight again, just to make sure that everything is good now. So yeah, now we found the ToonTap device. KVM is enabled. And if you'll get, this one will say that it is not found if 
you do not have the virtual machine, uh, the ability to establish virtual machines in your bio set. So, yeah. And we also have an SSH directory, so we're good to go. The next thing they would tell you to do is to install curl, get, and unzip. But as you can see, those are already here, so I don't need to do that. But you may. You may. And by the way, these there are steps for Linux and Mac OS. So if you're looking for Windows support, um, I don't believe this is supported under Windows. So the next thing we'll need to do is we'll need to download the source code. So let me just see. I don't have a Fuchsia, and I have some shell scripts here, but I don't have a directory called Fuchsia. So we'll go ahead and let me clear this up. And th this is going to go out and it's going to pull uh, a script and then it's going to pipe it to bash. If you're concerned about it, you could just pipe it to more and see what it's doing if you're concerned about it. But I've run it enough times. I'm not all that worried about it. It's, it's, all it's going to do is pull the uh, latest build and put it and create a directory called Fuchsia and then start installing all the components. This will take some time. It, Fuchsia is about 10 million lines of code <laughs> or something like that. So it's quite large. And we'll do a we'll do a source code count on it. Oh, one thing I will tell you is once it starts, you'll see it, it starts to display this opt-in message or opt-out. These collect analytics. So if you're concerned about, they could, they show you here if you're interested in seeing what they actually collect. But if you're really concerned about the analytics, you can turn them off right there. All they're doing is they're tracking what's going on with the uh, logs that are coming out of Fuchsia. It helps them debug the project. So, yeah, so they are using you to collect data for them uh, to help make the project go a little bit better. So, so it's done. And... I made the screen a little bit bigger, so hopefully you, you will be able to follow along a little easier. So so the next thing it says I need to do is export those to that path. So I'm, I've already set mine up, so I'll show you what I did. I have the export path set to my home directory, which is the tilde. And then we have Fuchsia, which is the directory. This is .jiri root bin, set, and that's appended on the front end of my path. And then I'm going to source, which is the same thing as doing the dot, uh, you know, be able to bring in the script and add the environment variable. Hopefully, if this all works, I should be able to go to the directory and do uh, fx help. That works. You will have to be in the directory for these to work. Let's just help. Okay, so everything is functioning as far as uh, the initial setup is concerned. So at least I have enough that I can actually do something with this. So what I'm going to do right now is now you would normally set up your firewall. Uh, in order to get the rules set up to allow. There's two pieces to Fuchsia. There's a serve part and there's the VDL part, which that is basically the client side. So there's a client, it is a client server model and you'll need to, you can look up, there's some information on, this, on the website about setting up UFW, but if you don't run UFW like me, I don't use uh, the uncomplicated firewall. But if, if you, yeah, yeah, if you're using something else, then you'll need to know what rules to add to your firewall. The next step is to configure and build. So there's a couple of prerequisites that we're going to need here. So uh, what we're going to what we're going to do is there's a couple of things you could do. Uh, you could do an fx set core dot q uh, emu dash x64. That's one of them. But we're going to do something a little bit different. So if you want to follow along, you'll need to look at where you start the Fuchsia emulator as for the correct code for this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do a, let me get back over here, workstation uh, dot, so this is the, product and the next piece is the board
and we're going to do a release level. And this will take a minute to actually do some, it's got to go through and it's making changes to the uh, header files, I assume. Yeah. So now it is, it's all set up and ready for me to start the FX build. So let's go ahead and do that. And this will take about an hour and 10 minutes. So, okay, so what I need to do now is I'm, I'm all successfully compiled. I'm moving back over onto my Fed machine so that you can see the GUI when it launches. Um, this one has already been installed. Same way, use the workstation to do it. And the first thing you'll wanna do is to execute FX serve. And that will start you know, a bunch of stuff that it's going to do, it probably will stop about there. And yeah, and then you'll, you know, as things happen, it's going to start connecting. So uh, at this point over here, what I want to do, I'm just going to execute the, the script, but I'll show you what that looks like. is that it's going to start this. And that it will prompt you if it has been used before. And right now the emulator is starting, but let me get over here and put it on this page so that you can see it coming up. So right now it's sitting waiting for this to initialize. And it's starting up. It takes a little bit. Okay, we're up. And this will then drop to a shell. But let's just spend a few minutes in here first. So this is a, a fully compliant POSIX environment. So most of your more common Linux uh, utilities will work. But there's a there is... Like if I do it, but the interesting thing is not everything is on here. So if if I did an LS, now in this case, it's already out here because I have downloaded it previously. But if something is a package that is available to you that is not already on the system, it will automatically install it for you upon first invocation of the command. So like for, and I'll show you where that is. So. Uh, you'll notice there's a directory here called, let me just get this out of the way for a minute. So it's not quite so confusing as to what text is what. So let me go to, let me blow this up a little bit for you. All right, so we'll go to package uh, FS, the, the package file system. And in here you'll see there's like CTL install needs package. Packages is where we want to go. And in packages, you'll see all these, these are commands. And the one we're looking for is that one, because we want to see LS, right? We want to see what happens here. So there's always a zero. Uh, you can pick any of them, they're all like that. I, that I think is a, some kind of version number. Uh, but it will, <laughs> right now, I don't know if it's actually being used. So if I LS the bin directory, you'll see that that is an executable. So that's a binary. It's, it is actually an ELF binary. And it's interesting that it has January 1st, 1970, which was the date Unix first came online at Bell Labs. So if you're wondering why they picked that date, that's why. Um, lib. And in lib, the commands, as I, I have mentioned previously, are self-contained. So all of the dependencies, all of the libraries that are needed by LS and for, for in order for it to run, have its own instantiation, its own copies, and its own versions. So you don't have this problem of, of libraries contending uh, with different versions that can cause errors in your system because uh, they're inside of the package. The also, you don't have this problem if I uninstall something that I don't lose the dependencies for a different package. So, yeah, I mean, that could un uninstall C++.so.2, for example. So, 
that could impact other packages on the system that happen to be using that same library. In this case, only the libraries are removed that are in the LS directory, so it's self-contained. How does this work? Well, um, let's go to the meta directory. <clears throat> Let me back up and go to the meta directory. Oops. All right. So in here, there is contents. And contents is the, well, yeah, I, I know. I know more is not here, but I have bad habits. So this is the uh, manifest, if you will, for the, the files and the executables and the libraries and everything else that support LS says that ls is going to go to the bin directory in the package. The, this is a, a lib, so you can see that the manifest has a complete list of everything in it. This is a cryptographic hash that is used to uniquely identify this version of ls. So it does two things. One, it validates that this ls is legitimate and has not been altered. And second, it, it makes sure that uh, that this particular version of LS is not colliding with some other version. So it doesn't, you know, doesn't need to replace it. Doesn't need to just create a new version for it. I don't know what their intentions are down the road for this, but right now that's basically a signing key. Okay. So I'm going to leave this here for a moment. I'm not going to sign out of it. Uh, if I do sign out of this environment, it'll take down the emulator as well. So out here, we have this is um, Flutter. And this is the user interface that, now this is very primitive looking, but I'll just bring up one example here. So I could open a terminal window, which I've already got down here. Or I could open up a simple browser or the spinning square, which doesn't appear to work. So we'll go ahead and bring this up. Now... If my service is running, I should be able to actually connect to Google, which is the second part of uh, Fuchsia. It, it does not make direct connection to the internet. It makes connection to the service. The service in turn makes connection to the internet for you. So yeah, and yeah, it, so there is a bit of a delay, I guess, between when it actually is running and not. So um, I'm not going to get too deep into this. If you want to explore it, there is do a well use Fuchsia to re learn about Fuchsia. So you can you can go through the principles and uh, look at the and if you want to contrib. I can tell you that this Explore Fuchsia is very highly tuned to people that are developers. So I want to show you a couple things before I, I, I log out of here today. But first, you'll notice that there is an FX command and there is an FFX command. Now, the way I understand that is FX is the command interface from the host operating system. So in my case, it's Debian into Fuchsia. The FFX command is a future version of the FX commands. So they have added additional capabilities to this, but they have not yet rolled this version of the FX command into the production or a single FX. I know that's kind of confusing, but they're basically creating this as an experiment. And then, they're, then they'll eventually, I guess, roll it over the existing FX. This you will find uh, highly tuned to developers. So if you're not interested in development, then you're probably not going to be too interested in exploring Fuchsia this way. But I just thought I would give you, there's a, there's a lot of reference material here. Uh, and there's a what's new. There's some guides on if you want to get started with certain languages and so forth. So I guess that's, you know, it, uh, other than a couple of things that I'd like to show you here, is let's get a new window open and you'll notice that my directory path now is fuchsia whenever i open a new window because it inherited from the previous one but uh all right so i'm, I'm in here so i want to do an fx 
the first thing I want to do is a list devices. So a device, you can have multiple instances of Fuchsia running. So this is the one, so this particular device is the one I just compiled and it has been associated with an internal IP address of that. So, and then you can, as you can see here, uh, you can set the device so that each time uh, you rerun this, it will automatically pick up this version of Fuchsia if you have multiples out here. Uh, the, so this is, again, uh, more information about my particular device that's running. Yeah, you have to use the FFX, not the FX, because that command doesn't exist in the, that's what it was saying. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. So, yeah. Um, and then we can do an FX target show. And this should list all of the ones that I can use. Well, actually, no. This is actually giving me more detail. So, again, this is my device that I just created. It's telling me what instruction set it is. Uh, it's showing that this is, is this a retail demo? No. And then there's some information here about what it's using. Now, in, in this case, the graphical user interface is actually, I think, being controlled by the internal Intel um, graphics processor not it doesn't like seem to like nvidia so <laughs> yeah so it doesn't seem to like that it doesn't like nvidia so much you can also turn on i can turn on a log watch so if i if i'm wanting to see how things are running and in here, if I'm doing development work and I'm starting to post things and I'm interested in how well things are actually being, you know, how, how well things are working and I can get my stuff and make sure of all that. So, but you can see there's quite a bit. Now, <clears throat> components, I have, we were just talking about components. That's what LS is. And I can also uh, reboot the, the client over here too. There's a couple of ways you can do that. So first you could do a DM command from inside of Fuchsia and you could do a reboot. Now it's, it's hung up. Now I'm waiting for it to come back up. It's back up. Uh, you can do a DM shutdown and that will terminate both the, I see the emulator just came back up. So you can, you can uh, do a DM shutdown and that will terminate the client side, but you'll notice the server side is still up. And that will say, oh, I don't have anybody here to talk to. So, uh, and that brings down your environment cl uh, cleanly. If you do a control C, you'll need to clean up this stuff in here because this will interfere with you attempting to run again because there are devices and stuff in there that it won't open. It'll have problems opening it again. So anyway, that's all I had, but I'll leave it to you. If you, uh, if you'd like to explore this a little bit, I just wanted to show you how to get things set up. This like I said, it will work under Linux. They prefer a, a, a Debian based, uh, operating system. So either, uh, either Debian or Ubuntu, Ubuntu. However, uh, I do know some people that are using Arch to do this, but I'm not sure all the pain and suffering you have to go through to actually get it to work under Arch. But I do know some people that are using Arch as the development platform for this. So uh, ARM machines are not supported yet. Um, however, <clears throat> there is there are scripts and, and product and board types for ARM64 in here. So apparently somebody's been doing some work on it. Um, I have done testing on AMD with a 3700X that I have, and it, it does work. Um, however, because there isn't a, on my CPU, there isn't an inbuilt uh, APU, I, I'm trying, it tries to use the NVIDIA one, which it, uh, it, pretty much cra it, it pretty much skews the screen. Yeah, it doesn't, it looks like it's missing information uh, in order to draw the screen properly, so. So um, I guess the, the, the bottom line here is that 
you can you can, you can bring fuchsia up. You can it will work. I'm using Debian 11. Uh, I mean, I have I don't have any other environments to test on. I have not tried this on Proxmox. I'm actually running this on hardware. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is I don't want to have the complications of trying to do nested VMs because Fuchsia does require a VM and it does require KVM specifically as well as QEMU in order to run. So uh, the other the other issue I have run into is it does not support NVIDIA. It, it, it doesn't like NVIDIA at all for the drivers. So uh, the only option I have on the AMD machine, since it doesn't have an APU, is to run it with the RTX 3070. So and that it, it will not display correctly when Flutter comes up. Um, on the Intel-based platforms, with the inbuilt built uh, uh, GPU for for uh, Intel, it works fine. I do have an NVIDIA card in this machine as well, but it seems to just pretty much ignore it. So, and that works pretty well. Uh, the cautionary things about this: pay attention to your temp files. There are some cleanups that you will need to do. So, if you run into issues like I did, where the one time you'll run it, it'll run great. Second time, everything goes to hell in a handbasket. Uh, go check your temp files. Make sure that you've deleted all the VDL uh, directories. Uh, make sure that you, uh, yeah, just clean it out. <laughs> just clean it out, and then uh, bring it back up again, and it should be fine. So that's my that's my advice for now. Uh, uh, let me know in the comments below if you tried this, and if you did, how far did you get? Uh, <laughs> hope to see you all real soon. And uh, hope you enjoyed this today. Please like and subscribe. See you next time. Bye for now.